Well, g'day and welcome to a special episode of the Ailey Couch Critics. We have hit 200 subscribers, as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and so we promised a special interview. And, well, that's what we're going to give you this week. We're going to be asking questions like, where's the next Ryan Grant going to come from? Uh, why aren't more players from rural areas making it into the A-League? Uh, will Bathurst, not Bathurst, apologies, uh, will Bathurst ever have an A-League team? Well, these are the questions that we're going to be asking our special guest today. You've probably seen him in the comment in the title of the video, so you know who it is, but we're going to introduce him anyway. Before we get there, make sure to leave a like if you enjoy this special interview. And uh, if you're new here, subscribe to the channel. We've hit 200. Why not more? So yeah. make sure you hit that subscribe button so you know when our next videos come out. And yeah, thank you to everyone that has got us to over 200 subscribers so far. We started this channel back in the middle of COVID lockdown last year, and I think July or something. And it's madness. I don't know. It was a bit of fun, but here we are at 200. Can we get 300, 400? Can we get a thousand? And we could finally start being paid by YouTube. <laughs> you know, my wife. Who knows? My wife the other day said, "I thought you'd do maybe two or three episodes, and then you guys would give up." But I'm pretty surprised that you're still going. Yep, we've been persistent. So thanks for your persistence in watching us yeah. and enduring us. And, you know, we want to raise the quality of this show this year. So we're going to be hopefully doing a few new things. But anyway, yeah. thanks for tuning into this video and um, enjoy our interview. Let's get into it. Well, uh, welcome Couch Critics. We have got a special guest with us here today. Uh, he was born in Manchester. Uh, he started his career as a football journalist in the 90s in the UK. Uh, his dulcet tones could be heard on the radio before jumping onto TV. And in the early 2000s, he moved to Australia, where he quickly became one of the foremost voices on the round ball game in Australia. Uh, his composed commentary of Australia's World Cup qualifier in 2005 lives long in the memory of almost every Australian soccer fan. And uh, he's nowadays kind of everywhere concerning football you can find him on radio you can find him on live streams and you can even find him now on our youtube channel it's a big warm welcome to our first ever guest on the couch critics simon hill how are you guys nice to see yeah. you we're very well and uh we're excited to have you here to celebrate us reaching 200 subscribers yeah. and uh yeah a bit of a special moment for us uh, congratulations guys <laughs> thank you well uh simon People know you pretty well, so we thought we'd start with some quick-fire questions to, to get to know the real you since you've moved okay. to Australia. So uh, the first one, which do you prefer, sausage rolls or meat pies? Um, meat pies, I would say. Yeah, without sauce, though. Oh, oh okay. Like I don't know if that's a good answer now. <laughs> <laughs> um, AFL or NRL? Neither. I don't oh. like either. That's the right answer as well. <laughs> no, it's NRL. Anyway, go on. Uh, what are they called? Are they thongs or flip-flops? Flip-flops. <laughs> well, that's because I'm British, you know. We're the, uh, the thongs to us are like G-strings. You know, <laughs> right. We're on your, on your behind, so. Uh, yeah, well, you are, you are British, so I guess we'll, we'll give you that one. Jazz or rock, rock music? I feel like this oh, music. come on. Rock, yeah, music. rock music. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Of course. Uh, and uh, I, I guess a twist on maybe Spider Kalich's favourite question, uh, which has been the best gantry to commentate football on? The best gantry. Now, I guess this also, <clears throat> excuse me, includes stadium commentary positions that aren't necessarily on a gantry i can sure. give you the worst one <laughs> to start off with uh the worst one was the vetch field at swansea city there um, are ground not before. because it was yeah that's right before the liberty stadium uh and the reason i've chosen that one is because i was doing a radio commentary there many years ago for a local radio station uh, on the bbc in the uk and it was swansea against blackpool and blackpool with a team that we were 
covering you know that was our local team so when they scored i think it was twice in the last three or four minutes to get a four all draw it was a crazy game still remember the the name of the guy who scored twice it was neil mitchell uh, and of course we were going a bit ballistic up on the gantry and it was right hung over the terrace where all the passionate swansea city fans were and they started pelting us with bottles and coins and everything they could get their hands on so that that was certainly one of the worst uh, the coldest ever was Port Vale. I nearly froze to death doing a commentary um, doing that at Vale Park. The best one, um, I think for a, for a kid growing up in England, uh, to, to call a game at Wembley is very, very special. So, And in those days, it was a gantry. Um, I'm talking about the old Wembley yep. before it was redeveloped. So, yeah, I would say Wembley Stadium. That was, that's a pretty special moment for any kid who grows up in England. Absolutely, yeah. We might be able to rival you for the worst when we start commentating some games out here at Bathurst, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how that right. goes. <laughs> <laughs> Hope they've got meat pies or sausage rolls for you. It would definitely be uh, Marjorie Jackson Oval out at Lithgow. <laughs> what, what's the Lithgow special? The Lithgow special. They've got a burger. I remember there was they had a burger there or something. It's the Lithgow special. Yeah, it, it's a hot dog with gravy. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's pretty, it's they used to, they used to have a, at the Western Sydney Wanderers. They don't do it anymore, but they used to have the Wander Dog, uh, which was the best <laughs> food got you got in the A League. Massive hot dog with lots of stuff on it, which was great. Uh, the ever declining Wanderers, but that's not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, chip shot. Uh, I haven't you, had uh, Sydney FC go the other night. Yeah, if you haven't guessed, uh, Brad's a Wanderers fan, and I am not. <laughs> are you Sydney FC? Are you? I am from from Ooh. day dot back in in two thousand and five. I picked my team right. and and stuck with them and yes. I'm very well, I guess proud geographically, Brad, Brad is closer geographically. Just yeah. Well, I grew up in Western West. Sydney, but um, oh, there you go. when I, when when the A League started '06, I wasn't really much into sport. But then I grew up watching rugby league. And I still watch rugby league. But when the Wanderers came in, I finally thought, well, we actually have a Western Sydney team because. Mm-hmm. Supporting the Penrith Panthers, no one liked anyone down in the eastern suburbs. So I'm like, I don't really want to go for Sydney Sydney FC. Yeah, They're too far away. That's fair enough. (laughs) Well, uh, we're here to talk about uh, some rural football. Uh, A couple of questions. uh, But before we dive in, I guess we should uh, qualify what we mean by rural or regional because we're we're not talking about Wollongong uh, as much as they used to be a regional side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like places like Wollongong, Canberra and Newcastle might be conceived as a bit of a regional area, but we're, when, we talk, when we're talking here about regional, we probably think more like Bathurst, like Dubbo, Wagga, Tamworth, mm-hmm. Indigo, Ballarat, all those kind of places that are a lot smaller than mm-hmm. Newcastle and Wollongong. And I think the, the first, what's the first question? Yes, that question. Um, I think it's a pretty straightforward question. Do you reckon a, a regional team could work in the A-League, whether it's through expansion or whether it's through a second division or whatever way it is? Well, uh, look, under the current model, probably not. Um, but I'm hoping that we're sort of progressing ultimately away from that model and more to a traditional sort of global model of football, in which case it should be on sporting merit. Um, mm. Now, of course, you know, in a country as big geographically as Australia, there are other issues to consider, uh, particularly financial ones. So whether you know, a team from, say, Bathurst or uh, Ballarat could financially uh, not just survive but compete in a national competition. I think that's very much open to question. And I guess it would would depend upon the will of the people living there, you know, whether they're willing to support it, whether there's enough uh, business opportunities and interest to, you know, to back the team. Because A-League teams and even national second division teams, you know, when it comes along, they're pretty expensive toys to run. Um, you know, you're talking millions of dollars. So I don't know. In a country like Australia where other codes tend to get preference and certainly, you know, have more hearts and minds than we do, uh, it would probably be very difficult. But that's not to say it's impossible. It could happen. I hope it does. Um, I'll give you one sort of little example uh, from the past. There was a team called the Morwell Falcons, yeah. who I don't know whether you remember them, but... Uh, you know, I went to their ground um, last season to cover a W League game. And to be honest, when I got there, I'd never been. I didn't know where Morwell was. Uh, I was surprised it was such a long way out of Melbourne. It's about two and a half hour drive. So, you know, seriously, 
you know, as far as Ballarat, in fact, probably even further uh, from Melbourne. And uh, when I got there, there was this beautiful, if rather um, neglected stadium with a stand on one side that had clearly seen better days, but you could tell that back in the day, it had been something a bit special. I, I, I did a bit of research into this and found out from a guy called Sebastian Hassett, who you may know, used to write for the Sydney Morning Herald. He's from that part of the world. And he sent me this beautiful video from the late eighties or early nineties when the Morwell Falcons were in the National Soccer League. And they just opened this brand new stand, which was the one that I sat in. Uh, and they'd paid $5 million for it. And it was pristine, it was full. And it, it, to me, going back last year, and half the stand was dilapidated, there were broken seats, there was bird shit all over the place. And it looked uh, really forlorn, to be honest. And I said to Seb, and he agreed, because he still has the club in his heart, that that really was uh, a symbol of, of football over the last 20 years. Uh, these huge dreams, even in rural stroke regional areas, uh, are now long forgotten and neglected and ignored. And it's a tragedy. And we know that football is strong in rural areas, uh, if not at senior level. You know, there's certainly a lot of players that play it and love the game, watch the game, as you two guys do. Um, and I think we have a duty to those areas not to forget them, not to just say, oh, well, you're too far away. It can't work. Uh, that's why I'm in favour of the global model of football, however difficult it might be. And look, you know, if you get a team in Bathurst and it falls over financially, well, that's just the way it is. You know, there's, there's plenty of places around the world that have had similar experiences, but I don't think you should be excluded purely for the fact that you live far away from a capital city. That's my view. Absolutely. And that kind of leads us on well to our next question, because for fans like Bradley and I, uh, we have and often do make the three and a half hour trip from Bathurst to go and watch our teams play. Good on you. Uh, which is, it, it's a great night out and, and I never am disappointed turning up at home at about 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. It was a lot better when we were at uni when <laughs> we could just skip class the next day, but now we work. It's, it's not. Yeah. Real, real life it catches more, but, up with you, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we used to do it a lot more, but we but rarely do it now. I wonder, what do you think the best way for A-League clubs to engage with the huge football communities in rural areas is? Because... I mean, Bathurst itself has seen a couple of games over the last 10 years. Uh, hmm. We had a game out at Mudgee and, and other areas like Port Macquarie and, and rural areas of Victoria have also seen spits and spats, but, but never a consistent presence uh, from A-League teams. Is that the way hmm. to get people drawn into the A-League if they're not going to travel? Uh, look, I think it's part of it. Part of it. Um, I definitely think there's a place for the odd game to be played in rural areas. Um, you know, even if they're only pre-season games, uh, they're all part of you know football's community. And you know, given that Bathurst is like you say about what three and a half hours from Sydney, those are the local clubs, if you if you want to put it that way. Uh, so why wouldn't they want to be engaged with, with those communities? Because they can still be fans of the club, even if they can't necessarily go every week. You know, you can still buy a jersey, you can still watch on TV, you can still become committed to the club in some way, even if you can't physically get to the ground um, every week. So I certainly think that's part of it. But to go back to sort of your earlier question, for me, this is why you, you need a, a proper pyramid of football. You know, if there was a Bathurst in a Division 2 or even, you know, some way down the track, even in a Division 3 or 4, um, there are plenty of areas, you know, in the country that I come from, England, that doesn't, don't have a Premier League team, but they still have a team that plays, you know, lower down in the pyramid somewhere. So they've got that connection to football and they know that if their team eventually becomes good enough and Wimbledon are the great example of this, you know, that they exist. All right. They're in a, a big conurbation in greater London, but they're cheek by jowl with Chelsea, Arsenal, Tottenham, West Ham, all those big clubs in London. Yep. 
but for many many years they were semi pro they were in the, the the you know the very low reaches of english football and they just kept getting promoted and promoted and promoted and eventually they they reached the football league and went all the way to the premier league that's what football dreams are made of and i understand that geographically and financially it's it's a lot more difficult in a place like australia but i think we've been guilty for too many years of just saying we can't do it it's too yeah. hard we well, got to find a way because, you know, at the moment, I think as much as I love the A-League, and I do, uh, and obviously worked in it for many, many years, but it's not the be-all and end-all of football in this country. Um, and if we, if we continue with the glass ceiling and exclude everybody else, we're missing out on a huge connection with the rest of the football community. Um, so that's why I'd like to see it happen. I know it's tricky, but sooner or later it has to come in for me and then you know you can go and watch your local team you might still have mm. affection for the Wanderers or for Sydney FC that might be your big club in the same way that <clears throat> you know a lot of people in England support for example Oldham Athletic but they're also a Man United fan or a Man City fan yeah, yeah. Um, you know the, the, the two aren't mutually exclusive always so mm. I think we've got to sort of move towards that at the moment what we have is a system whereby you know if you're not in the A-League you don't matter and that's wrong for me. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You want to my big question? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. a big question. Well, a bit of explanation behind it. So when I think out in our area in Western New South Wales, uh, we've at least what we can think of, we can only think of about a handful of players that have gone on to make it in the A-League. So we got Ryan Grant from Canoundra, Archie Ryan Thompson Grant. from Bathurst, yeah. Nathan Burns from Blaney and Jacob Tratt from Dubbo. I don't know if there's any of that come to you, Simon, or... It definitely Not hasn't really. been a whole lot of my real head. big names. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, and really in regional, like small regional areas outside of the big cities of Sydney, Newcastle, and Wollongong, I can't think of too many. Um, and so I look like, <laughs> I, like, I know you don't like the NRL, but I look at them for a good example of how they really integrate um, kids from country areas. Like my team, Penrith, we had four guys from small regional areas that Dor guy from Dorigo guy from tomorrow guy from Dubbo and a guy from Wellington or Park Wellington New South Wales and that was in their grand final team and I'm really really strapping my mind to think of any many A-League players that actually come from any regional areas outside of like Newcastle mm -hmm. Sydney Wollongong and so I guess the question is why aren't regional areas producing more high profile players when we know football is the most like I know football is more played out here than rugby league or any other sport um do you reckon it's a lack of resources, exposure, or are they simply just not good enough to crack it at the A-League? I, th I don't think it's the, they're not good enough to crack it. I think it's pathways and opportunities. Um, and certainly the A-League clubs could do a lot more, I think, in trying to connect. We've already spoken about this mm. to the rural communities. Uh, there's definitely a case to be made for that. Um, some of it is purely financial. Um, there's a big difference between the A-League and the NRL when you look at mm. the, the yeah. terms of the TV deal, yeah. you know, they get, they get a billion dollars every year. We get, what is it? 28 or 32 million. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, they're operating on budgets that are 10 times uh, bigger than ours. And therefore they can afford to have uh, their net cast a bit wider. They have regional development officers that are employed probably to have a look at that talent and say, Hey, mm. Penrith Panthers or whoever it is, you know, there's a, there's a good guy in our backyard. Now, we have those connections in some ways, but they're not um, a, 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 as high a level. And also the game in Australia, and this is a big, big problem, massive problem. The game in Australia operates in silos, operates in little bubbles of people who only look in their own backyard. Now, I'll give you an example of this. A few years ago, I was asked to MC a function for a local club in Sydney, in the, in the Sutherland Shire. I won't, I won't say the name of the club. One of the biggest football playing uh, areas in the city. And there were all, there was about a thousand people there. This, and this was one of the smallest clubs in the Shire district. So, you know, you can see the size of football in Sydney. There was about a thousand people there and they all had scarves on of the club that they, you know, we were there to represent and, uh, everybody was passionate about football. They loved the game. Um, they loved watching Johnny or Joanna kick around on a Saturday. They coached the team. They made the tea. They were the physio, blah, blah, blah. They were very heavily invested in football. 
And I went around the room saying, how many of you watch the A-League? And there might have been half a dozen hands. That's what we've got to fix. People are passionate about football in this country, but they're disconnected from the A-League. They don't watch it. If they do watch football, more than likely they'll watch the Premier League. More likely is that they are involved with their club on a Saturday or a Sunday, but when it comes to actually paying to watch sport, they'll go and watch the NRL or the AFL or cricket. So that's the disconnect that we have to fix. It's not easy. I don't pretend to have any of the answers because I think we've been trying for about 60, 70 years. The A-League almost got there about four or five years ago. I thought we were very, very close to cracking the mythical mainstream. And unfortunately, our leaders shot themselves in the foot by destroying the one big point of difference, and that was our supporters our active fans who made the sort of unique atmosphere that football provides and none of the other codes do. Um, and we kill that from within because we were trying to appease <clears throat> some mainstream media types who didn't want our game to succeed. Now we've made mistakes like that for decades. Um, we've got to stop making those mistakes, simple as that. So, sorry, I've gone a bit off tangent in terms of the answer, but the, the answer, unfortunately, is multi-layered. Um, there's no one silver bullet for it, uh, but it's a combination of, of all the things that I've mentioned, I think. That's it. I think you highlight quite well that the A-League uh, needs to connect with the game Australia-wide, uh, and that <laughs> is difficult when it's a, a competition that's separate and not connected structurally to the rest of the game. And, and I think things like the FFA Cup have been really good, particularly in our area. Clubs are starting to get a little bit more involved with that. And, and we saw our Western New South Wales regional team make it to the, the round of 64. They were one game away from hosting Melbourne Victory, which would have been huge mm. for the That area. would have been terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't you have the Western Mariners as well? Yeah, so that's the club. They, they used to be the Mariners, mm. but they dropped it because... They were partnered with the Central Coast, but didn't actually do anything with them. Yeah. But that game, they lost the Balmain Tigers and Balmain went on to host Melbourne Victory, who had Archie That's Thompson. Right. And so I work at the local newspaper in town and they were like, we had the headlines ready, Archie Thompson back in Bathurst from where he's from. And <laughs> uh, unfortunately, they lost uh, an extra time to a, at the time, I think they were a team below them hmm. in the NPL. But you see, you know, the, the FFA Cup, sorry to interrupt, the FFA yeah, Cup yeah. is the greatest example of that connection and that's why people love that competition because A, it connects the smaller clubs and the grassroots of the game and the rural communities uh, to you know, the A-League and gives them a chance to be on a level playing field. But it's, also, it's a narrative. Yeah. As, as a journalist, you know, I know that calling the A-League for 15 years, which I did, you know, if the Central Coast Mariners beat Melbourne Victory, it's not really a story. I mean, it, it's sort of a story, but it's not really a big story. Mm. Now, Bathurst 75, beating Melbourne Victory, that's a story. Yeah. Yeah. That's a ma and that's what happened when Apia Leichhardt Tigers defeated Melbourne Victory. Yeah. You know, that's, wow. You know, this, it's a shock. It's big club v. small club. It's David Goliath. It's semi-pro versus pro. It's third division versus top flight. Those are the stories that keep football going. Mm. We don't have any of those. Because we play the same teams in, and you know, just to go back to another sport, this is one of the reasons why I can't personally get invested in the AFL and the NRL because it's the same teams going around and around and around, and around you know, for the last hundred years. Um, at least in football, we have the FFA Cup, we have the Asian Champions League, we have the Asian Cup, we have the women's game, we have knockout competitions, blah blah blah. The, the final missing piece of the jigsaw is that second division and, be, and beneath and the promotion and relegation. Um, once we got that, the world's our oyster, I think, because it, then everything is connected. I, I often thought, you know, being a rugby league journalist know, must have been the most boring job on earth. Every year, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. What, what's next year? Oh, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would Definitely. die of boredom. You go to the same grounds every year. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, mate. I know you're a rugby league fan. Oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. Just <laughs> No, it's fine. Yeah, no, I, I've been reading recently, I should have gotten onto it earlier, the, the Death and Life of Australian Soccer by uh, Joe, Joe Gorman's book. Yep. And, and, it, and it fantastically highlights a lot of 
those same issues that have been in the game forever. And, and we really hope that we can move past that. And again, there's a bit of hope riding on the, the 2023 Women's World Cup, although I'm starting to be a little pessimistic of, of what might actually come from that tournament uh, in terms of helping football break through and really mm. grab the imagination of mm. everyone. Uh, but I think we're always close, but never there. Uh, and I think over the last couple of years, there's been some great strides made towards it. Things like soccer is making the World Cup every every four years has <laughs> is, is been really good for football in this country. But I'd love to see us just really reach that next level and and for rural areas to to be a part of that journey would be something really special i think yeah. even if bathurst could host any any of those european teams out here you know we've got we've got pretty good facilities if they were to come out here and they were to be based in bathurst and you know they go play their world cup games down in sydney or brisbane or whatever hmm. that'd be massive for the town yeah. it, it would be regional. massive but yeah. but what would and again just to go back to your point about the women's world cup what would the legacy be mm-hmm. now in in 2015 we had the asian cup in this country which was fantastic for the the mm-hmm. month that it was on everybody was engaged with it and as soon as it packed up and left town the a league ratings dropped off a cliff nobody watched it it should have been the reverse because australia won the thing yeah. um and you know in terms of the legacy for regional areas I don't know if you know this, but the Japanese team were based out at Cessnock, which is uh, a little Newcastle. little way out of Newcastle. It's not massively rural, but it you know it's regional, yeah. and they were hosted and and the the ground was refurbished to accommodate the Japanese team for, for that tournament. And what happened after the tournament? Nothing. The ground got turned. The ground got turned over to the rugby league team. Yeah. Now, what's what legacy is that for football? Um, and that, that's what concerns me about the Women's World Cup in 2023. You know, we just seen the release this week of the legacy program. And, you know, part of it is community facilities, which I totally applaud. Um, I would like to see a commitment to expand the W League. Mm-hmm. So we have a proper legacy for the national competition for a start. Yeah. Um, and what facilities is the game going to get out? I keep hearing about, you know, oh, it's going to be great for women and girls. Yep, I, I accept all that's fantastic. But this is a football tournament that we're bringing to Australia. We're bringing the whole world because of football. That's the sport that should benefit. Um, and I, I'm just concerned that, you know, post-Women's World Cup, it's going to be the same story as we had after the Asian Cup, but we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, thanks so much, Simon, for your time here chatting to us. We, we recognise you. you've got lots of things going on uh, with football everywhere around you at the moment and so we really appreciate you spending some time to come and chat to us uh and yeah we we wish you the best kind of going forward this year in 2021 hopefully there's lots of goals to enjoy uh in your footballing journey hopefully a good regional team goes on a good run in the ffa cup yeah that would be great (laughs) that would be great thanks for having me guys nice talking to you not a problem at all thank you 